there's Matt on Christmas DIYing a 3D printer at my house because that's what you do, right? So Matt loves to code, he loves to hack. Um, and in the left, there's some of his great code. Who can tell me what language that code's in? Come on, you guys, you had lunch. What, what language, what language? Swift, rock on, and it's about bacon. So Matt clearly has good taste, okay? So Matt loves to code, he loves to hack. So I got a question for you guys. What do you think Matt does for a living? Yell it out, what do you think? What, do you, what does he do? What does a guy who builds a 3D printer on Christmas do for a living? Developer, wrong. He's a fifth grade history teacher. So I met Matt when he was being a fifth grade history teacher in the context of the nonprofit that I run, Teaching Kids Programming. So Teaching Kids Programming is an open source repository on GitHub, woohoo, that has courseware for middle school age teachers to teach to middle school kids, or to middle school teachers to teach to middle school age kids. So this is Matt's class, but Matt is not the teacher because five years ago when I met Matt, he didn't know how to code. He wanted to learn how to code, Fortunately, my daughter, who's in the blue shirt over on the right side, and who was 13 at the time, and who's been coding since she was eight, was teaching the class. <laughs> so she was teaching her fellow middle schoolers to code with our library, and Matt asked if he could possibly take the class. So he did. And Matt, being Matt, went from there to here. And he's now teaching in his middle school. He not only learned to code, he learned how to teach coding. So Matt being Matt, not only wanted to teach coding, he wanted to learn how to contribute. Now being completely new to coding, we set up the environment the first couple years, my daughter and I, and he was not even aware where the code was hosted. He literally said, what is GitHub? I don't know what it is. This is our website, and you notice we have a little Octocad on there. And we actually made our website because we've been in business, or a nonprofit, but for eight years, and over and over I hear from school teachers, what is GitHub? So we basically made this website. We got a grant from a crowdsourced um, contest. We won from Microsoft supported it. We hired some professional UX and design people and made this front end to our GitHub repositories for school teachers. So that's all well and good. Matt figured out, okay, if I click the little Octocad, I go to GitHub. So he said, all right, I want to contribute. I want to write some Java recipes now because I've been teaching this for three years. How do I do that? And I said, oh, you know, it's pretty easy. You just go to the internet and you watch some of these screencasts and you know, you can just get, you can just get going with it, right? And about a month later, Matt came back to me and said, you know, I'm a little embarrassed, but I, I couldn't get started. And I thought back to how I started. And I used the GUI client. And I thought, well, here's a GUI client. And I'm going to make some screencasts so Matt and other teachers can get started. And I did. Also, we paired up. It's really, really important bringing new people on to pair either in person or over Skype. I've worked with tens, maybe even hundreds of teachers all over the world getting them started, and they just need that initial help to get going. Here's Matt's first recipe. You like it? He wanted to add a rec recipe into the recursion section, and he and I wrote this. It looks like a little computer chip. The kids love it. Super cool. So your job today is to find a Matt. Thank you very much. Thank you, Lynn. So this is a session of lightning talks. Uh, it's called Six Short Open Source Stories, Pains and Gains. Uh, it's actually five, because apparently I can't count. We had uh, six speakers, and one of them got promoted to be on as part of the keynote tomorrow. So we are down to five. It's like the song with the 99 bottles of beer. Now there are 98. Open source, for people who are deeply embedded in open source, it's really easy to imagine 
sorry, Chen, would you set up? <laughs> it's really easy to uh, imagine that everything is obvious. We do it every day. It's part of uh, our workflows. It's, uh, it's part of our subconscious. And while there are challenges, most of those challenges are in how do I solve the technical problem uh, or the algorithm or how do I integrate against this technology? And one of the problems of open source, it turns out, is that we put in place sometimes artificial barriers to actually getting started and making your um, first commit. I'd like to introduce Jason Chen, who runs an open source project. Uh, we started this story with your first commit. This is when you have more experience. You've made a number of commits. Uh, and you might be moving into the, the phase of your open source journey where you actually maintain a project. Jason. All right, thank you. All right, so good afternoon, everyone. All I'm going to be talking to you about uh, overcoming maintainer DDoS. And so a lot of you are probably starting wondering what that even means. So it, it starts with GitHub issues, which is where most communication happens for an open source project and a lot of uh, closed source projects. Uh, it has a great benefit that anyone anywhere can create an issue. Uh, that makes GitHub issues very democratic, fair, and open, which is awesome. But it often takes a lot more time and effort for a complete and thoughtful response from the maintainer. And so if you are the type of maintainer who wants to be welcoming to beginners or just maintain a high quality standard for answers, you oftentimes have to spend a lot uh, more effort to compose a good response. And so some of you with a networking background might recognize these two as key characteristics for a denial of service, the distributed nature of and asymmetric resource nature of GitHub issues. And this was definitely something I experienced with my own project, which is called Quill. When it was kind of gaining in popularity, there was a point where I was spending all of my time answering questions on GitHub issues instead of having any time to build features. So that, of course, isn't sustainable for long term for an open source project if you're not making it better. So an obvious, uh, an obvious solution would just be to spend less time. But uh, this, has some sh this does work, but has some shortcomings where, for some people, some of your question answers might appear abrupt, blunt, or short. And they might get frustrated and then post this on your wall. Uh, this is an actual comment on a rejected Quill PR. <laughs> so it kind of shows, well, I think it inspires that we can all do better. So the thing. I, there's a lot of things that you can do to help, but the thing that I'll just share with you all today is what works best for me. Uh, and that's really simply to just ask for clarification. I think a lot of time is spent uh, answering many types of, uh, when you're not clear what the user is asking, you spend a lot of time guessing, and then you're kind of answering three variants of a question instead of just one. So if you're not clear, you can just ask, can you elaborate or what did you mean by X? And this has a great benefit of you immediately get to respond to the user and tell them that you're paying attention and you want to help them out. And people respond really well to this. And you don't spend a lot of time guessing what the possibilities are and potentially answering the wrong question, but also answering different variants of a question. So I have to admit I kind of stumbled upon this solution because in general, it's my personality to kind of be eager to answer questions. Uh, part of it is, I'm sure like a lot of you, uh, you feel good about being knowledgeable, and I feel like I should be knowledgeable about the project that I run. But there was, there was a question that was asked initially that, that I had no idea what, what the person was talking about. Um, and so I really just had no choice but to ask them to elaborate. Uh, I was pleasantly surprised that they did, rather quickly actually. And you can see they explain in two whole paragraphs, including the code that they were trying, which is very important for trying to figure out what's going on. Uh, and some of you might notice that this person actually even edited and polished their clarification, which is super helpful uh, for obvious reasons. 
Uh, so now I can just answer the one question that they had instead of uh, potentially answering the wrong one or spending a lot of time on different variants of their question. Uh, as a bonus to this, though, and as I was composing the response, uh, sometimes you don't even have to answer one question. Uh, sometimes in the process of explaining themselves, they just answer their own question. So then you at most have to answer one question. So this is what I found to be super helpful. Uh, and I think it generalizes to projects, uh, not just open source, but with coworkers. I'm sure you've done to your coworkers where you went up to them and dumped a lot of information and said, oh, never mind. Uh, so if one thing I want to take away from this is uh, if you're unclear on something, just ask for clarifications. Thank you. When I first got started in open source, I thought it was about technical problems, and I was really excited about technical problems, so that was really cool. And the more open source I did, uh, and the more I thought it was about open source uh, technical technology and um, the really juicy technical bits and pieces of this, the more I failed at it really hard until I started learning about people. Uh, this is Gregor, he works at Hoodie, and he will be bringing us from the, the space of the maintainer maintaining a project and working with individual contributors to the project that has grown so much that there are now people involved who are creating a community around the project. Thank you, Gregor. Thank you so much. Can you hear me well? A little bit louder, closer, or? All right, can you hear me well? All right. Um, so yeah, thanks so much for having me and thank you for coming over. So I think Lynn um, made a great point on how we can create fronts on top of GitHub or in front of GitHub to make it simpler to onboard people. And Jason had great tips to use the resources that you have, the people that you have in an open source community uh, to handle more requests and to sustain more growth. And this talk will be more about how you can get more people to actually become active contributors and maintainers to the project. So it's 2016, and thanks to GitHub, I think collaborating on code had become so much simpler than we could have ever dreamed of like 10 years ago. Today, I would say that um, code or code collaboration is no longer the problem. It's kind of solved very well. People are. Just imagine, like, people are coming to your open source project, they are entering the space, they are looking around, and if they don't feel welcome, they will turn around and they will leave. And you lost a potential contributor, a potential maintainer, and you lost them forever, and you won't even know that they have been there in the first place. And the people, you know, who make it through, like, this oftentimes very intimidating experience um, not finding the way around are people who are more confident. Maybe they are overconfident. You know, maybe they are a little aggressive. Maybe they are a little self-entitled sometimes. Does that sound familiar? And this is a huge pain um, that I want to address now um, with my little talk in open source that we see today. And it's very, very hard to correct this problem once your open source community is dominated by a certain kind of personality. But more importantly, you're missing out as an open source project. You miss out on the people, you miss out on perspectives, you miss out on creative thinking, you're just missing out on a very healthy, diverse open source community. I think I'm doing this wrong, sorry. At Hoodie, um, we are working very, very hard to try to make the most inclusive, most diverse open source community that we can. And despite being you know, a comparably small project without any funding, um, we get a lot of recognition for our work. And the bottom line is, if we can do it, then every project can do that as well. And one thing that we did um, is we created a dedicated space a dedicated place for all our contributors, be it new or existing ones, as well as for our maintainers. 
So we created this little website, hoodie.camp. And hoodie.camp is a static website. It's hosted on GitHub pages. So it does not create any additional work for us to maintain, because all the data that it displays is just loaded from GitHub itself through the APIs. And I want to give a big shout out to the GitHub API team, because it's really amazing what you can do right out of the browser with the existing API. And boy, am I excited about the new APIs that are announced today. So on the HoodieCamp page, we have full control about the user experience. We can do whatever we want with it. We are not limited to what GitHub.com provides us. So we can make it more unique. You know, we can add our branding. Like all these animals, they have all their own stories, and they represent different teams. And we can clearly communicate these teams are equally important to what we do at Hoodie. And we don't differentiate be code between like coding and non-coding. Instead, we differentiate between coders, designers, documenters, writers, and so on. And for each of these teams, we show issues that are loaded from GitHub, which are all prepared um, to be picked up. And when you click on these links, you will be redirected to github.com to one of these issues that by themselves clearly communicate that you don't need permission um, to you know, claim this issue and work on it. And it has a lot of description and step-by-step -step information on how you can get started. And some of these issues are reserved for people who contribute to Hoodie for the first time. We created other things like a milestone app, which you're working now to integrate into uh, the Hoodie camp. And there are so many more things that I would love to talk about, but you know, time doesn't allow me, so please find me. But two things I want to highlight, I think it's worth it, is showing recognition. Showing recognition and appreciation is very significant for the retention of your contributors and maintainers. And another thing is transparency, like what is actually happening in your community beyond just code. I think there is a lot of opportunity there. In code, what we did is we carved the way for best practices with the right tooling. And I hope we are now in a time where we create more tooling for community management, which will achieve the same thing. And I hope that GitHub will lead the way, just as you'll lead it with code collaboration. My favorite quote is by Saron um, from Code Newbie. Uh, she once said, you don't build community, you build a space. And that's what this is all about. Thank you very much. Thank you, Gregor. We're going to move away from the uh, the from within the inside inside a project and the maintainers and contributors to someone who wishes to use the product project from the outside at a time when a project has reached that unfortunate place in its life where it is no longer really alive. So this is Enrique, who will be talking about uh, how you use a project that is maybe not actually still around. Thank you. How many of you, how many of you have, a, have abandoned a project? Any project? I left many of them behind. But don't worry, because every forgotten repo is an opportunity. A few years ago, I was upgrading the main app at work, and I found a bug in an open source library that we depended on. Let's just call it the Mango 7 library. It's not the real name. The next day that I found the bug, well, the first, the first thing that I did is I opened the GitHub issue and reported the bug. But nothing happened that day. The next day, I figured out what was the problem and submitted a pull request. And my pull request was accepted. It only took seven weeks. <laughs> Anyways, I really wanted to give back to this project. I felt this project was important for me, for my company. So I ended up contributing more. And eventually, one of the main collaborators asked me if I wanted to become a maintainer. I said yes, of course. 
So what is an abandoned open source project? Let's just say that is one that doesn't have activity from the owners for a certain period of time, even though the community is still active. Open source libraries often get abandoned. People start, people start a new job. They start programming in a new language. Life goes on. But if the people who started the project gives up, why should we care? I think there are three main reasons why should we care. And the first one is dependency. These days, software is built on top of millions of open, on open source libraries. And we depend on all those libraries for doing our job and innovate. So we should care about them. The second reason is security. Every day, new bugs, um, new security issues are discovered. So I think it is in our best interest to figure out how to solve those issues for all our dependencies. Security and trust are important part, are important values of open source. The third reason why I think we should rescue projects is because if you have a fix and you don't submit it, you're missing an opportunity. Or even if you don't have the fix, you can just report the issue and maybe spark the conversation that will, bra will bring back the attention of the maintainers. Or what about that new cool feature that you worked on? Share it. It might benefit others. How can you start? You can contribute in the area that you want. You don't even need to write, write code. You can start by writing documentation. You can contact the maintainers and to be nice with them, be thankful, be grateful. It's more common to interact with someone who maintains an open source project because they care rather than because they get paid. In my experience with the Mango 7 project, I wanted to make a new release, but I didn't have access to the release platform. So I opened a new pull request, I emailed people, I tweet, and finally I got the access that I needed. And it was at this point that I realized that I have interacted with three different people from the Mango 7 project, from the original maintainers. One who merged my pull request, the other one who gave me a, a GitHub access, and finally one who gave me release access. They were still acting as a team, even though they haven't been active for a while. They built a good community. And that leads me to my last point. I think that the biggest constraint open source has is time. Time from maintainers, developers, and everyone else involved. And the best tool that we have to figure out big problems for a long period of time is collaboration. A healthy community promotes collaboration. You are part of the community. So please, consider helping an abandoned open source project. The future of open source and the software industry is the community. Thank you. Thank you, Enrique. The next uh, piece of the process of open source that we're going to talk about is when a project is so good that you want to use it at work, and you now have to convince people, stakeholders, business people, people who might care about things that you didn't think about necessarily and the trade-offs that you don't know you're making, and convince them that this project is ready for production use. This is Quinn. Thank you. Hi, everybody. OK. Uh, can you hear me OK? Can you hear me OK? OK, there you go. All right. Uh, hi, everybody. I'm just going to get right into it. Uh, I've got good news, and I got bad news. So the good news 
is open source is everywhere in the enterprise. Yay, right? Uh, it's not a question anymore of will we use open source software? It's just which open source software to use. And that's, I think, everybody can agree that's pretty great. Uh, now the bad news is change is still frightening. Uh, it's difficult a lot of times for us to move forward uh, and into the unknown when the, we derive comfort and some benefits from standing still. So how does this bad news collide with the good news I was just talking about? Imagine that you found some really great open source project that's sort of unknown, maybe to the world or at least to the stakeholders in your organization. And so this best tool for the job is a new tool. And then that new tool is a vector for change. And like we just covered, change is frightening. Uh, so what this means is that anytime you're trying to introduce these uh, new tools uh, to stakeholders in your enterprise, that it can mean a fight. And for, for me, when I think about having a fight, I think of Street Fighter V. <laughs> I could be a little too literal, but uh, it, you know, it's a fighting game uh, where you can battle with people, uh, with your character online, and try and climb up the ranked ladder. And it seems like a weird comparison, but in, in both the context of a new open source project and uh, climbing up this ladder, you're, you have unproven contenders trying to make their case to some section of the world. Uh, and for both contexts, you need uh, structure and focus in a way that you're going to approach this that'll make sense. So here's some things that I found uh, climbing the ladder that I've also used in the enterprise that will be useful for you. First thing, use a training room. So Street Fighter V comes with a really great uh, training room feature that lets you demo and test the viability of all sorts of things before you actually go and uh, fight with it. So in your organization, you want to use a training room by making micro uh, proofs of concepts and demos uh, for people to, not only for you to test out things, but for people to interact with and to look at when you're talking about it, a show don't tell. And why you need to do that is that the future is hard to see. And so you want to give people the opportunity to interact with it, to touch it whenever possible. Next tip, learn to block. This is important. Uh, in Street Fighter, you'll hold back before an attack comes in uh, to defend against it. In your organization, you hold back by thinking about what can go wrong uh, with the project, what it's bad at, uh, not to be only on the good points. And you, you need to guard the life bar of it, as it were, to uh, really leverage its strength by every project is going to have trade-offs. It's going to do some things well. It's going to do some things poorly. And if you can explain before someone brings it up uh, or that you've thought about it, uh, that'll just increase confidence in the project. Uh, so now you need to know your matchups. You'll have a character in Street Fighter V, and they'll match up against other characters. And you can't play the same way against each character. Every matchup is different. And in your organization, you need to tell different stories. You're going to have different stakeholders, and they care about different things. So you want to highlight aspects of the project that appeal to different stakeholders. Uh, and no matter what, you need to relay to them how, from what they value, they benefit more from moving forward with this new project rather than standing still with whatever they have. So the last tip, and I think maybe the most important, is learn to lose. I wish I could tell you I've used all of this advice to amass a huge 100% win streak online, and I'm uh, at the top. That's that's not true. Uh, I, have, I have wins and losses, and, and organizationally, I had wins and losses. But, but losing is, is important in a lot of ways, sometimes more important than winning, because it tells you what you still need to learn. And despite your best effort, sometimes uh, people just are going to say no. Often, it's a matter of timing. 
either the business isn't ready or your project isn't ready. Uh, and sometimes in that, if that's the case, the best thing to do is just let time pass and, and maybe revisit it later and things will have changed and it might be a better fit. And sometimes you maybe need to consider that you're wrong and that you might have evaluated it poorly or something else has uh, gone wrong with it that you missed. I, I've talked a lot about how you can try and push for change, but to be effective at bringing change, you have to be willing to be changed and so uh, and be willing to evaluate your part of the effort. Uh, and overall, just keep in mind that this is an iterative process uh, where you're gonna try different things and you know, move on, win, lose. And ultimately, it's not over till you choose not to continue. So whether you're playing Street Fighter V or you're advocating the adoption of some unknown uh, but really great open source project, uh, what I want you to do is go out there, uh, do your best, fight, learn, change, keep trying, and thanks for playing. strikes me, one of the things that strikes me about open source is that we are in this together. This is a story that we are telling to each other as humans, uh, and no matter which side of the story you are on, we are humans. There is a concept in psychology called the fundamental attribution error that I run into every day of my life, and it goes like this. When I make a choice, I understand the feelings that I have in the context. And so I understand the broader context of the choice that I make. And when it turns out that it doesn't work out, it's not because I'm a bad person, it's because I'm having a bad day or because something complicated and nuanced is happening. And the farther away I am from the problem, the simpler it looks. So my friends and I make difficult and bad choices because we're having bad days, and people we don't know make choices because they're bad people. And I feel like if, as open source uh, contributors, developers, maintainers, consumers, we can remember that the closer you are to the problem and the closer you are to the emotions, the more you'll realize that we are all having a really bad day. Thank you. Thank you.